Dragnet. Ladies and gentlemen, the story you are about to hear is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned a robbery detail. Three holdup men have robbed and beaten two supermarket operators in your city. You've got a good description of the thieves. Your job, get them. It was Tuesday, November 3rd. It was cold in Los Angeles. We were working the day watch out of robbery detail. My partner's Frank Smith, the boss of Chief of Detective Stab Brown. My name's Friday. We'd gotten a hot shot call about a robbery, and it was 9.46 a.m. when we got to the corner of Lockwood and Barton Avenues. The Lockton Market. Officer back there. Yeah. Friday and Smith sent a robbery. Oh, yeah. I'm Jackson, Unit 3A7. You answered the call? Yeah. We got here a couple of minutes ago. Where's the victim? Back room there. He's pretty bad off. Ambulance attendants with him now. Mm-hmm. My partner's checking the neighborhood. If there's nothing you need me for, I'll give my hand. Huh? Yeah. Make a 211 report for you, Lee, will you? Right. Thank you. Looks like there was quite a fight. Yeah, stuff all over the place. Come on. I got my bottle. It sure stinks. All right, you got to clean up these cuts. I'll try to hold still. Ow! Hey, take it easy, huh? Yeah, something you want? We're out of central robbery. Is this the victim? Yeah, a couple of cuts, nothing serious. Tell him about Andy. He's the one who really got it. Who's Andy? The other clerk. Pretty rough. Looks like it might be a fractured jaw. He's in the truck now. Now, let me get this tape on you now, huh? Ow! That should do it. Might be a good idea if you saw your doctor. Yeah, what about Andy? Uh, we're going to take him down to Georgia Street receiving. You going to call me and let me know about him? That uh, might be better if you call them. Yeah, okay. Oh, I'll see you guys, huh? Yeah, right. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, yeah sure. Boy, that one guy really clouded me. Hurt. Mm-hmm. What if you feel up to telling us what happened here? Three of them. Three. It came in and held up the place, clouded me and Andy. Sure hope he's going to be all right. What's your name, sir? Cliff Hall. You own the store, do you? No, me and Andy run it, though. We'd like to buy it. What time did these men come in? Must have been around 9.30, around in there. Did you give the officers who answered the call a description of the men? Yeah, that was the first thing they asked me. Go ahead, please. I was getting the money ready for the bank deposit. Andy was back here stacking bottle cases. These three guys came in. First off, I thought they were customers. Yeah. A couple of them walked to the back of the place. I thought they were picking out stuff. The other one kind of stood around by the cash register where I was. Go ahead. Well, after he was there for a minute and I see the other two aren't picking up nothing, I asked him if there was something I could get for him. That's when he pulled out a gun. What about the other two? Oh, it worked like they had some kind of signal. As soon as the one in front pulled his gun, the other two did too. The asked me to put all the money in a paper bag. Got the bag from up in front there. Took it right out of the stack and handed it to me. He said for me to put the dough in it. You recall his exact words? What? The way he said it, the words he used. You recall them? Well, let me see. I think it was, put all the dough in this bag. Don't say anything. Just do as I say. That was the way he said it. What'd you do then? Like he said. He had that gun pointed right at me. I could see the other two guys. I wasn't going to do anything but what he told me. I put the money in the bag. Mm-hmm. I thought they'd leave the place, but that's when Andy came out. I guess he wondered what the other two were after. You see, from where he was, he couldn't see the guns. Well, yeah. He walked out to him, asked if there was anything special they were looking for. Mm-hmm. What happened then? Well, then he saw what was happening. He saw the guns, and he tried to throw the guys out. I don't know why he did it. Andy's like that. He gets an idea in his head, and there isn't anything that'll shake it loose. He tied into those two guys, almost had them whipped, too, even with the guns. The guy that was with me saw what was going on, yelled back at him, told him not to shoot. He ran back and laid his gun alongside Andy's head. Oh, clotted him right along in here. Mm-hmm. Andy dropped like a sack of potatoes, and the three guys ran out of the store. How much money did they get, do you know? Uh, I hadn't finished up with a bank statement yet. I'd just be guessing, but I'd say about $8,000. Might run to eight five, but that's about it. I see. Well, if you could just give us a description of the man. All three of them? If you could, yeah. The one who was with me must have been about 5'11", kind of dark-complected, had straight black hair. What color were his eyes? Brown. You have any marks or scars you could see? No. Clean-shaven? Yeah, I had a real dark beard. Looked kind of like he had some kind of talcum powder on. Do you remember how he was dressed? Let's see. A dark blue suit, gray top coat, gray hat. Was he wearing a tie, do you know? Yeah, a gray tie with maroon stripes. You know, kind of diagonal, a thin tie. Anything unusual about him? Make it easier for us to identify him? No, I don't think so. How about the gun he was carrying? What kind was it? I couldn't see the name. No, sir. I mean, was it an automatic or revolver? Oh, an automatic. Looked like a big caliber. I'd say forty-five. 
One of the other fellows had a revolver, but the guy with me and the small one had automatics. You know if they drove a car? Well, if they did, I didn't see it. Might have had it parked right out in front for all I know. I told you I was busy when they came in. When they left, I was too worried about Andy to pay any attention to him. The way they hit him, a terrible thing, right along here. Oh, excuse me a minute. I got some aspirin here in the drawer. Yes, sir. I sure hope Andy's going to be all right. We've been together a long time. Can't get over that little guy, the one who hit me. I should have taken him. But the big one, he's a tough-looking, a real fighter. Well, this is going to help much. Huh? He's going to lose this one. We got the descriptions of the other two men, and the supplementary local broadcast was gotten out. The two officers who'd answered the call found a woman in the neighborhood who'd seen three men leave the vicinity immediately after the robbery. She said that she was parked in a car half a block from the store on the same side of the street. She explained that about 9.20 a.m., a car had pulled into a parking place in front of her. She'd seen three men leave the car and walk down the sidewalk in the direction of the Lockton Market. About ten minutes later, the men came back to the car. They appeared to be in a hurry. One of the men was upset and arguing with the other two. She told the officers that they'd gotten into the car and driven off toward Hollywood Boulevard. We asked her to describe the three men. The description she gave us matched the one we'd gotten of the thieves. She gave us a description of the car, and another supplementary broadcast was put out. We asked her to come down to the city hall to go through the mud books to see if she could give us a positive identification. The report from Georgia Street Receiving Hospital indicated that the victim of the slugging, Andrew Rich, was suffering from a fractured jaw and a concussion. He was given emergency treatment and removed to the county hospital. The crime lab crew came out and they went over the store for physical evidence. They were able to lift three partial fingerprints from the counter next to the cash register. Dean Bergman and Leighton Prince explained that the partials were not enough for identification, but that if we apprehended the holdup men, he'd be able to tell us if they'd left the impressions. 10.27 a.m., we took the victim, Clifford Hall, and the woman who'd seen the car to the mug room. They went through the mug books, but they were unable to come up with an identification. We had the stats office make a run on the M.O. They came back with a list of 17 names of men who at one time or another had used the same method of operation. The list was split, and Sergeants Meade and Leitner worked with us in checking the names out. Thursday, 3.48 p.m., Frank and I got to the sixth name on our list. Jerry Evans tonight, right? Yeah. Sure dark in this hall. He ought to wash the windows, let some light in. Yeah, here we are. Why not be in? Yeah, we'll try it again. Now let's talk to manager. Yeah. Yeah? Who is it? Manager, we want to see you a minute. Mr. Man. What do you want? I just sleep. Come on, Emerson, open up. Yeah, we can get out of here. Police officer. Come on, come on. Watch it, Joe. All right. All right, come on, Emerson, get up. What are you doing? I'm coming. Look, you got no right to come busting in here like this. Yeah, you're so clean. What are you putting that trouble for? I got scared, that's all. I just got scared. Well, how'd you feel if somebody woke you up and then shoves their way into your room? You ain't gonna stand around and just let them do it. He's clean, Joe. I told you that. Oh, look, I, I got no trouble and I don't want none. You check with Galloway, he'll tell you. I'm home every night at 9 o'clock, every night. Where were you this morning? Huh? This morning, where were you? What time? You just tell us what you did, starting when you got up. I was up all night. I, I got a virus or something. I couldn't sleep. Take a look there in the dresser. You can see the stuff I've been taking. I haven't been out of this room, not for a couple of days. Can you prove that? Why? Can you? No, there wasn't anybody here. You got any phone calls? No. I don't know what this is all about, but you guys are leaning on me for nothing. Now, you talk to Galloway. He'll tell you I've been working. Well, look here. I'll show Where you. Where are you going? I just want to show you something I got in the drawer. Well, you stay right there. I'll get it for you. Okay, I got nothing to hide. Take a look in the top drawer there, left hand side. Yeah. At least what you mean? Yeah, that's it. I'll take the rubber band off and look. You'll see I'm telling you the truth. Now, you see? It's all the check receipts I've gotten from where I work. You, you look at them. I'm working every day and I'm home at night, oh, nine o'clock every night. How about it, Joe? Yeah. Now, you see? You haven't been out of this room all day, huh? Not a minute. Now, come on, what's all this about, anyway? What are you guys after? We figured maybe you could tell us. Yeah? Well, I'm sorry. Without you telling me what you want, there's nothing I can give you. You see any of the boys anymore? You mean the fellas I knew before I fell? That's right. Not if I can help it. I'm trying to stay away from them. See any of them lately? Yeah. I saw Alex a couple of days ago. Alex? Yeah. Alex Finley. I knew him when I was up in Q. He came in where I was working. Did you talk to him at all? I right. just said hello. Passed a couple of minutes talking about some of the guys we know. See in the rackets now? I don't know. Is he on parole? Yeah, I think so. Did he give you anything? 
Oh, a couple of rumbles, but if I turn them over to you, I don't want a credit for them. You don't know where you got them. All right. Alex tells me there's a gang that's going to start working here in town, market jobs. How many men? Well, from what Alex says, there's four all heavy guys. Finley with him? No, I don't think so. He told it to me that he just heard it. Did he say anything about who the four men are? No, I don't think he knew. He just said they were heavy and they were starting to work. You know where we can get in touch with Alex? No. Well, you might check with Galloway at the parole office. He might have. Yeah, we will. I'll probably see him again. I'll, I'll try to get the information if I can. Well, what is it? What does he want to know? Who the guys are? That's right. Okay. Now, like I told you, though, I, I don't want any credit for it. I'm in real trouble if it gets around that I'm playing footsie with you. Yeah, sure. I'll try to find out when they're going to start working, too. Well, don't you worry about that. Huh? We already know that. 4.10 p.m. We got in touch with Fred Galloway at the state adult parole offices, and we checked on Jerry Evanston. From what the record showed, the story Evanston had told us was true. His parole officer had reported him working and apparently living up to the conditions of his release. We left him one of our cards and asked him to call us in the event he heard from Alex Finley. 4.21 p.m. We checked back into the office and we met with Sergeants Meade and Leitner. They told us that they'd checked out the names on their half of the list without result. We sent a teletype up to George Brad and CII Sacramento, giving him the description of the holdup men and listing the M.O. that they'd used. We asked him to run the information through their files and forward any information they came up with. 5.19 p.m. We went out to get something to eat, and then we checked back into the office. Good dinner, huh, Joe? Yeah. I never saw a guy could eat so many enchiladas as you. Yeah, I can't help it. I get started on them. Can't seem to stop. Yeah. You got any soda in your locker? No, you got trouble again? You know I always do when we have enchiladas. You ought to remember that when you order a half a dozen. I suppose so. Yeah. I get it. Robbery Friday, yeah. When was that? They're pretty sure, are they? Has the lab been called yet? Yep. Okay. Right, thanks. Oh, that's a break. Yeah? They just found the getaway car. Six forty seven PM. We left the office and drove out to where the car had been found. It was parked on Lockwood Avenue, five blocks from the market that had been robbed. The radio car officers who had spotted it had called the office immediately when they saw a brown paper bag in the back seat bearing the printed name Lockton Market. A crew from Leighton Prince came out and went over the car. They were able to come up with a single print from a man's index finger. Bergman compared it with the parcels found at the market. They matched. We checked the white slip in the car and found that the vehicle was stolen. The report on it had been filed at 10.37 a.m. that morning. We talked with the people in the immediate vicinity, but none of them were able to tell us anything about the people who'd parked the car. However, we did come up with an elderly man who told us that he'd seen three men get into another car at about 9.45 that morning. He said that he remembered it because the driver of the car had pulled into a parking space and stopped the motor. Another automobile had parked directly in front of the car, and the driver of the first machine had moved so that there was no one in front of him. The man went on to say that a few minutes after the driver pulled into the second parking place, three men had come around the corner, gotten into the car, and the four of them had driven off. The witness was unable to give us a description of the car other than to say that it was a late model Plymouth or Ford. The only description he could give us of the men was that one of them was large and was wearing a gray top coat and a hat, and that one of them was small. 8.40 p.m., Frank and I went back to the office and checked out for the night. The following morning at 8.02 a.m., I checked back in for work. Hi, Joe. Good morning. Kind of cold out. Yeah. You look happy this morning. I didn't sleep a wink last night, Joe. Not a wink. What's the matter? Stomach. Next time I even think about eating enchiladas, stop me, will you, Joe? Yeah, sure. Any mail come in? I don't know. I just got in. There's an ad here from that store over on West 6. They're having their annual sale. Yeah? I want to try to get over there. I'd like to get me a new suit for Christmas. You know, there's a special delivery from Burton. Huh. Probably those mugs we asked for. I'll see. Yeah, there's six of them. You want to get in touch with Cliff Hall? We can drive over and have him take a look at them. Yeah. You got any other pictures? Yeah, we can mix them up. I'll call Hall. Okay. I sure hope we get an eye, Dent. We haven't got much to go on. Well, there's got to be a break someplace. we got to find it. From what Finley said about the gang starting up operation, doesn't sound like just one job. No. They start on a string, they can do a lot of damage. Well, it doesn't give us much choice, does it? No. we got to get to them. 8.27 a.m., Frank and I left the office and drove over to talk to the victim, Cliff Hall. We showed him the mug shots George Brereton had sent us. He picked one out and said that he was positive that the man in the picture was the one who'd held him up. The name on the mug shot was Harold Bishop. 
According to the record Brereton had sent us, Bishop had been convicted twice on violation of 211 PC, armed robbery. 9.20 a.m. We drove over to the county hospital and showed the pictures to the other victim, Andrew Rich. He picked the mud shot of Bishop as a suspect who'd robbed and beaten him. The notation on Bishop's picture gave us the information that he was on parole at the time. We returned to the office and put in a call to Fred Galloway at the State Adult Parole Office. Yeah, Fred, this is Joe Friday. Mm-hmm. Yeah, fine. We'd like some information on a Harold Bishop. San Francisco number 82609. 26, that's right. Male, white, Caucasian. We got a mug from Barrett. No, he says he's on parole. Yeah, if you will. Thanks a lot. Keep checking the master file now. Mead and Leitner are standing by if we need them. When we get this address, we're going to have to move fast. Yeah. Yeah, Fred. When was that? Well, how's his report there? I see. No, I don't know. Yeah, I suppose. Right, Fred. Thank you. Well, you can tell Mead and Leitner to relax. Bishop's got an out-of-state parole. He's living over in Phoenix. Well, he still could be getting into California. No, not likely. Huh? Fred checked with his parole officer. Yeah. He's got a job, and he's been reporting to his parole officer every month. We asked Fred Galloway at the state parole office to contact Bishop's parole officer in Phoenix and check him closely. The report came back that the suspect had a job with a small contractor and that he'd been working regularly. He'd also been giving monthly reports to his officer. We'd had a suspect identified by two of his victims, and yet if the information we'd gotten was correct, it would have been a physical impossibility for him to have committed the robbery. We got a copy of his jacket and looked over his past record. We found that Bishop had been arrested for armed robbery the first time 18 years previously. He'd been brought to trial and acquitted. The next arrest was 10 months after his trial. He'd been convicted and served six years at San Quentin. He'd been released, and within six months, Bishop had been picked up again. This time, he was sent to Folsom Penitentiary. While he was there, he appeared to be a model prisoner, and after serving four and a half years, he'd been placed on parole. After leaving the prison, he'd requested and he'd been granted an out-of-state leave. In checking Bishop's M.O., we found that it matched exactly that of the thieves who'd held up the Lockton market. The time of approach was the same. The number of men used was the same. The method of leaving the scene was exact. We had a suspect, and yet... He couldn't have committed the crime. Three weeks passed. On Saturday, November 26th, the thieves hit again. In checking with the victims, they identified the mugshot of Bishop. We put in a long-distance call to the Phoenix Police Department and asked them to check on the suspect. We got word back that he was in their city. They told us that he wasn't at work due to a virus infection. They went on to say that they checked with his landlady and that she told them that Bishop hadn't left his apartment at all on the day of the theft. Monday, November 28th, we got our first break in the case. I'll get it. Robbery Smith. Yeah. Oh, yeah, Jerry. Uh-huh. You sure about that? Where? Uh-huh. How about the rest of them? Yeah, just a minute. Toss me that pad, will you? Yeah, here you go. Okay, Jerry. Go ahead. Yeah. Mm-hmm. How do you spell it? L-A-L-E-A-H-Y? Uh-huh, I got it. Mm-hmm. You know the address? Yeah. Okay, thanks, Jerry. We'll get in touch with you. Right. Jerry Evanston. Remember the guy we talked to over on South 7? Yeah. On the way, he tells it we aren't too far off. What do you mean? He saw Bishop in town last Saturday. We put in a call, and we found that there were two major airlines with flights to Phoenix. The flight time they listed was one hour and 35 minutes by air. If Bishop caught the last flight leaving Phoenix, he could arrive in Los Angeles at 11.20 p.m. the night before he planned to commit a robbery. The next day after the holdup, he could catch a plane from the Los Angeles International Airport that would have him back in Phoenix at 8.25 p.m. By doing this, he would be absent from his work only one day, and he could schedule his flight so as not to hit on the days when he had an interview with his parole officer. Tuesday, November 29th, a meeting was held in Chief Thad Brown's office. It was decided to put a special stake out on the airport and wait for the suspect to come into town. At that time, he'd be followed and taken into custody as he prepared to commit another robbery. The names of the three other men Jerry Evanson had given Frank as having been involved in the holdups had been checked through R&I. All three of them had arrest records. Surveillances were placed on their homes, and they were kept under constant watch. Monday, December 12th, 11.15 p.m., Frank and I relieved the stakeout at the airport. There's a bench over there. We can keep all the gates in view. Yeah. I wonder when he's going to hit again. I don't know. 
The last couple of weeks have sure dragged by, haven't they? Yeah. Anything on the other three guys? Well, I talked to Pinky Mead this morning. He and Lightner are staked out at Lay's apartment. How are they doing? Nothing. They're parked in the car down the street. From what they say, Lay's like a clock. He comes in at 5 a.m., leaves at 9 p.m. every day. <laughs> Got a cigarette? Yeah. Here you go. Thanks. Joe. Yeah. Bishop. Let's let him get outside. Yeah. I wonder if he's got any luggage. I'm going to bring it up outside. We can wait for him there. All right, come on. You see him? Yeah, there he is. Getting into that cab. Come on. Frank and I got in our car and followed the cab taken by the suspect. We followed him out of the airport grounds and then up La Brea Avenue. The cab turned right on Washington Boulevard and headed for downtown Los Angeles. We pulled up to a stoplight. Still got him? Yeah, he's still up ahead in front of that blue mercury. See him? Yeah. You got the number of the cab? Mm-hmm. 2974. There's the light. All right, let's go. Better try to pick it up a little, Frank. Cap's pulling away from us. Yeah. Think he's seen us? No. Can't you close in a little? Traffic's too heavy. Can't use a siren. We'll trip him. Yeah. Still see him? Yeah. There's a break. Guy heads making a right turn. Now we're right behind the cab. Yeah. I'll close in now. Good. Watch it, Frank. That guy pulling out of the alley. Hold on. <laughs> As we drove down the street after the stoplight had changed, the car had failed to make a boulevard stop coming out of an alley, and we'd hit it broadside. The damage done to both cars was considerable, and we'd lost our suspect. Frank got to a phone and called the office. He gave them the number of the cab that Bishop was in and asked for a traffic investigation car. The office started a search for the missing suspect. Lieutenant Jack Smyers told us to proceed to the apartment of Tom Leahy to wait for further development. In the meantime, a citywide broadcast went out carrying the description of Bishop and the other three men involved in the theft. Frank and I arrived at the apartment, and we relieved Mead and Lightner. We had the manager of the place let us into Leahy's room. We waited. 1.30 a.m., 2.30, 4 o'clock, 5.30 a.m. Frank and I had been on duty for over 21 hours. At 5.45, the phone in the apartment rang once, and then it quit. That was the arranged signal between us and the office. Frank put in the call. Lieutenant Myers told us that officers Max Herman and Ed Benson were on the way out to relieve us. Fifteen minutes later, we heard somebody in the hall. Yeah? Yeah, probably Benson and Herman. Yeah. I'll get it. Watch it, Joe. Look, look, I'm up, Bishop. Is all right, Joe? Yeah, come on. He's going upstairs. Let's make it for the roof. Come on. You see him? No. You want to take that side? Right. Watch it. Behind the elevator shaft, Joe. Yeah, I see him. You're in trouble, Bishop. Don't build any more for yourself. I got nothing to lose. They'd help me again. I'll be up at the joint for life. Don't talk to nobody should you. There's no way off this roof, Bishop. Throw that gun out here and you follow it. You're out of your mind, cop. Give it up, Bishop. Now, come on, throw that gun out. I'm going out, cop. You try to stop me, I'll blow your head off. You all right, Joe? Yeah. How is he? I'd better call an ambulance. Yeah. What's that fill out of his pocket? Wait a minute. Something they'll never use. Yeah. Airplane ticket to Phoenix. Albert Martin Kruger, Harold Nelson Bishop, Thomas Nagel Leahy, and Charles Everett Lee were taken into custody and brought to trial for two counts of robbery in the first degree. They were convicted and received sentence as prescribed by law. Robbery in the first degree is punishable by imprisonment in the state penitentiary for a period of not less than five years. Because of his previous record, Thomas Nagel Leahy was given the maximum sentence and is now serving life imprisonment in the state penitentiary, Folsom, California. Dragnet is a presentation of the United States Armed Forces Radio Service.